We sometimes make agreements with other souls that no longer serve us. They could be that one will continue to do abusive behavior to another. Yes, this can cause continuing pain to this person lifetime after lifetime. Now, the ironic part of this is that the receiver might not even be aware of this contract still being in effect until that receiver says, this no longer serves me and puts an end to it. So throughout all of our lives, we can sometimes put vows or agreements with other souls. Yeah, sometimes those are in place. And as soon as we're aware of them and our awareness is calling forth that we are maybe struggling with something, it can relate to a vow that we have in place from a previous lifetime. So as soon as our awareness is brought to it, the first thing we should do is, is it still serving me? If it's not serving me, then we can dissolve it instantly and bring our awareness back to now shifting to the current state of being that we're searching for or trying to hold that frequency of. And some vows serve a purpose. So always being in that current state of awareness, you can put another vow in place um, and then follow that because it's serving the frequency state and the engagement in other souls that you're calling forth into your life in the present now. So how do you clear, like with your clients, how do you clear these vows? Like say they no longer serve them. Like what do you do? What do you do with your clients? You can definitely do cord cutting. So as, or, um, so as soon as the vow is witnessed, you can cut the cord to it, the energetic cord. You can also dissolve it, stamp it with a red stamp saying, I dissolve this contract. It no longer serves me. And you set it free energetically. And then it no longer is tethered to your current state of being. Once the client realizes that they perhaps took a vow of silence, oh, that makes sense. So there's this awareness. Is that right? Correct. As soon as you're aware, then your current state of being shifts to the new awareness and the state that you want to hold. So we can leverage that. The minute that we become aware of our state of being and how we are energetically to it, we can shift and call forth what it is that we want and dissolve that which is no longer serving us. So being a Reiki master healer, let's say somebody's past traumas have now manifested into a physical ailment. So when the body is restricted and it shows up in a physical ailment, the beautiful thing about Reiki energy is it's the release of the restriction. So energetically as the practitioner, I just open back to the state of alignment as well as the, the perfect harmony within the cells of the body. And the release comes by allowing the restriction to just be let go. In that state of non-resistant, the cells can harmonize back into health and balance. So fear, how is fear affecting us? Fear is a state of reality that once it's embodied, it can feel very paralyzing. There's always a moment before full engagement with an emotion. And it's in that pause that you can recognize that you're going into a fear-based reality and then change the frequency back to safety and security. I mean, we're seeing it on a global scale, um, a lot of confusion and chaos. And then internally as well, because not being able to handle what everyone's talking about in the state of the world, it kind of makes you need to go within to see where your truth is, where your security is, where your safety is. So the more that we can anchor that in within ourselves, we can really anchor in truth outside of a fear-based reality. The misconception of negative and positive you know, that's, that's a term that a lot of people like to use because it's a starting point. Is something good or is something bad? But in reality, if you come from a place of non-judgment, then you, you back off a little bit of judging everything in your life as either good or bad. And then you're allowing it to be as it is. And then engaging in the, in the experience of it from a place of non-judgment and inviting that sometimes things that are perceived as bad can actually be rearranging 
for the higher potential of your life or for the higher outcome. So some things that are perceived as bad can actually be working in your favor. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of chatter about, well, that's negative or this or that. Yeah, right. so that makes a lot of sense. Now, for me personally, I believe I'm in the fifth dimension. Do you think that we're in the fifth dimension? I think there's some of us that are definitely in the fifth dimension. I think collectively, um, as a whole, we are in the fourth dimension, which is the no time space reality, because we've all been unplugged from 3D. Everybody's turning on the TV and they're aware of that things just aren't working the way they always were. So they can see it, they, they may not know exactly what's going on, but they're definitely aware that something's not working anymore. So with that, it's kind of back on the pause. COVID-19 brought us into everything's on pause. Time went on hold for a lot of us. So now we're starting to see that time goes by quicker. Weeks don't feel the same. Days and hours don't register like with us like they like they used to collectively. Our friends, our coworkers are talking about it. And then there's some of us who have embodied the one point wholeness perception of non-separation. And from that wholeness is the new earth and the fifth dimensional frequency that some of us have fully embodied. I think collectively we're in the fourth dimension ascending into the fifth dimension, which is more unified and harmonious one point perspective um, coming from an all knowing state of love. That's the fifth dimension. The fourth dimension, it's not having time, space, reality work the way it used to. Without time and space, we're living in an instant manifestation reality. Thoughts become things. You can go to sleep and wake up and your life can be very different. Um, things that you were planning could, could go in a different direction because you held a thought that changed what you were going to do, and it's instant. It's very fast. Because without no time space, you're always living in the now moment. You're just in the current now, and you're reorienting your being to the now state of frequency. Do you find yourself going about your day wondering what has happened to the world? Are you done with the fear, confusion, and anger you're seeing all around you? Is listening to the news, trips to the grocery store, and how you see your job just not the same as it once was? We have a new lecture course on navigating out of 3D. Now we're here to tell you that there is a better life out there waiting just for you. We have answers to questions you might be asking and divine guidance on how to rise above it all. Now go to lifetoafterlifeacademy.com to see this lecture course and more. So you and I talked about the difference of fear versus uncomfortableness. Once you've engaged in fear, you're kind of stuck. You're, you feel paralyzed. Yeah. You, you can't see any options for yourself. It's hard to see what the next experience can truly be and to trust it. So in the uncomfortable pause of I'm not sure what to do next, I'm always telling people, just, just be in that pause for a moment. Because what you have at your advantage is to bring your awareness. And once your awareness comes front and center, now you can engage with what you choose. How do you help release your clients? Let's say they have fear with maybe their job or something. How do you release that fear from them so they no longer have such fear like at their job or something? Just take a look at what fear is. What is fear keeping you from? So I always bring them back to, if you're in a state of fear, then choose security. Fear is unknown. It's I don't feel safe. It's I don't know what to do next. So then start with your point of reference of what do you know? Where's your security? What are the things you can count on? Where does your heart tell you? Once you can bring back that point of reference and lead from there, then you're leading from your higher self. You're leading from the highest perspective that's going to lead you towards the best option or the next move or open up a door to a new job. It's in that fear-based reality, you just don't think you have anywhere to go. But that's not true, which is why fear is an illusion. It's not real. It just blocks off potentials, the realm of potentiality. 
And once you reference back to that, you can now engage in a new experience, which gets you out of the state of fear. If you're living, let's say you're at a job and you're fearful of your job and you're just perpetrating more reasons to be fearful at the job. So when you're in that job and you're engaged in fear and your boss does another situation and you're convincing yourself, see, I, I, I'm, I'm, this job is going nowhere and I'm getting feedback, you're engaging because you also have an element of expectation. And since we're in this fourth dimension reality of no time space, every thought you're thinking from, from, from within is manifesting your reality on the outside. So by engaging in the thought on the fearful boss, maybe wanting to not have you there, you're creating the universe to give you exactly that thought that you're having. So if you had maybe perhaps a self-esteem of value and just hold that, is that what you're saying? Just hold that, that frequency, I'm valuable. My boss is very appreciative. Instead of having that fear, which creates which creates the environment to give back. It confirms. It confirms your state of being. And because we're in the fourth dimension, boom, next week. Yep. And then all of a sudden you go, my life isn't what it was a week ago. This isn't working like it used to. And you think that it's happening to you, but actually the universe is responding to you. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Sometimes these cords can come with hooks or tentacles and require a little more effort to remove from us. Can one do these more difficult ones themselves? Yes, I believe one can remove them themselves. But sometimes a shaman or a Reiki master light worker may be more suitable for some of these more embedded cord removals. Now these experts can also assist in one having a much needed shift in perspective. So tell me about divination. Well, Craig, a divining is an action-oriented process. This particular divination process that I do is from the West African tradition of Maladoma Somme, who's a West African shaman. Maladoma Somme? Maladoma Somme. And he's a chief or something? Yeah, he's a chief in his uh, tribe, country. And so the divining is an action-oriented process. So as soon as I, the diviner, work with you, the divinee, spirit opens up the channels and the action and momentum happens. Ah. Just like when we had our- Oh, with my, yeah, my divination. Your divination, your uh -huh. session. Right. So as soon as you say yes in that contract, then we've opened up the channels for the divining to happen. And that can even occur before we actually sit for the divination. Most people that I talk to feel that action and that momentum starting to move. In the divining process, I'm looking with spirit, with my guides, several uh, tentacles, we could say. And that is, yes, tentacles of like the octopus. So it's not just what's happening, symptomology in your life now. Mm -hmm. From the divining process, I'm looking to see what are some of the root causes of that symptomology that might be playing out right now. And so in that symptomology, when I go into the divining process to look at some of the roots, it could be from any ancestral karma. It could be a past life karma. It could be this life karma. And it could also thread into some binding ancestral loyalties that need to be cut. Ah. Contracts that need to be released ah. with our loved ones that have passed because it gets passed down from generation to generation. The it being some of the disease, the discourse, the dysfunction. So that's, you know, that's kind of a, what we look at, what I look at in doing some of the divining. And each person is unique to experience that divination. 
The other thing in a divination process is we could look at the elements. Those elements being the five basic elements of earth, water, fire, nature, and mineral. And when these elements are out of alignment, that could also bring about a disruption. Now's the perfect time to segue into the soul retrieval that you perform with people. What's, what's that all? How do you do that with your clients? So the first thing I would say about a soul retrieval, again, because I am somebody who likes to address the root, not the symptomology. 99% of what a client is bringing to me in a symptom is not the root of the issue or the matter. Uh -huh. So in a soul retrieval, I will go into a divining process to actually investigate, is the person able at that point in that moment to hold that retrieval of the soul? Uh -huh. And if they're not, then there's a preparation that really needs to happen. And for me, as an elder, as a healer practitioner, that's ethically my responsibility. And I'm real passionate about that. So in the soul retrieval, what is the root of the soul loss? It could be a sudden impact of a trauma from a little child that had their bike stolen to a car came around the corner and smacked and created an accident. The soul is so vast, it can expand and hold. Mm. What the psyche can't, the soul will take the hit. Right. And so that's where we you know, uh, as a shamanic practitioner, bring that soul pot back into that person. It's like a homecoming. So it could be from a sudden trauma. Another soul retrieval that I do is, particularly in relationships, couples, when a relationship ends. And the root of that normally is created from a codependency and a binding contract with your lover, partner, husband, wife, and so what can happen between the two that loved each other once upon a time or that they're still in a relationship is they could be stealing each other's soul part. Okay. From the codependency of the enmeshment. I see. Yeah. So then there would be a retrieving that comes back as well. I heard you say once before that don't jump quickly into the idea of a soul retrieval. You do an assessment. Don't put the cart before the horse. So you actually talk with the client and yes. get inside their head a little bit. Yes, and thank you for saying that. Yes, and to see if they have the capacity to, for me to retrieve that soul pot back. And I can tell you, I've retrieved soul pots in keyholes mm. underneath ancient rocks. So the soul pot will go anywhere it needs to to hide. Mm. And if you retrieve that as a soul retriever and you bring that back into the person and they're not ready, they don't have the foundation to integrate the essence that was lost. Mm. Because it's not about, oh, I lost this soul pot from an accident and I didn't feel self-worth. The essence that gets retrieved is, I'm worthy. And that's the part that must be integrated into the receiver with the soul being retrieved. Okay, so we also talked earlier about ancestral karmic lineage. Mm. And you and I did something with me. Yes. And found out some interesting things that... Yes. <laughs> that needed a reset. <laughs> yeah, blew my mind and blew my soul out. So, so tell me about this karmic, uh, ancestral karmic yeah. Lineage. You know, in the ancestral work, uh, we look at it and I look at it in a sense of there's patterns, behaviors, disease, discourse. And from our ancestors, even generations that we didn't even know, it gets passed down these patterns, these behaviors through the bloodline because there's, uh, well, let's say, a loyalty that we don't even know we're binded into. Just from the sheer fact of being born into this family. And so what we do, first I would, you know, go through it more often from a what divine- What do you do, like a, like a 
an empathic scan. How do you see what's going on? How do you, is it an Akashic record kind of thing or what are you seeing? Yeah. So, you know, it's of course checking with my guides, ah. checking with my spirit guides that are, you know, leading me and, uh, in my own purification work, because I think that's really important as a healer practitioner is that you ha I have my own spiritual hygiene mm -hmm. so that I'm able to have a clear channel to receive the messages I need uh -huh. from, you know, who's guiding me to do this journey, this process. So in the ancestral work, I look at what are some of the sickness, some of the disease, some of the behaviors, some of the pattern and behaviors that that client, that person, that community, that corporation, I mean, can't shake off. There's something that's blocking. And then, you know, you look at it and you say, okay, where's the reset? First step often is you got to acknowledge that you got to release the binding contract of loyalty and then do the purification. Sometimes that's done with a fire ceremony. Mm -hmm. It could be a water ceremony. Mm -hmm. It could be a nature, earth, mineral. There's several ways that that can be disconnected. And it's, please know it's not from an abandonment because what happens in the ancestral world, the more that we purify and we unbind the contracts dysfunctionally, the more that our people can continue on their ascension. Ah. So we're actually helping. Well, I think uh, that happened with my mother. Mm. You know, the abuse with the father, mm -hmm. she didn't really do anything about it. Yeah. So there was a little bit of that, and I didn't even know I needed to forgive her. Right. So we, we worked through yes, that. Yes, we did that forgiveness process. And I process. felt my mom in spirit. Oh, I just got chills. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I felt her get lighter. Yeah. And I felt this big old thank you. Yeah. And I knew that it was helping the whole soul group. Yeah. There it was beautiful. It, it is beautiful. Thank you for that. Yeah. Most welcome. <laughs> Truly. I was actually surprised at how easy it was to gain access to everything we want to know about ourselves. This really has a lot to do with no longer paying attention to outside opinions, beliefs, brainwashing, but rather going within and trusting your inner voice. And then after all, your inner voice has no reason to lie to you because your inner self has only your best interest in mind. So how do we keep these negative energies away once we've removed them or dissolved them? You just keep stepping out of your comfort zone, really. So if you find a trigger's coming up, Try to do the opposite. I'm fearful about going on a road trip. Maybe that could be a negative past life. Maybe you are in a past life, you are in a car accident going on a, you know, adventure. This time you're fearful, your anxiety, you feel a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You need to push yourself forward and just go with it. It's not, you're not gonna get another car accident. I mean, if you set the intention, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna get in a car accident. Chances are going to be a lot higher than if you don't say that. Now, if you're fearful and you tell yourself, I'm going to go on a road trip. The road trip is going to go like this, or I'm going to have an amazing time. I'm going to get there right on time. I'm not going to run out of gas. The universe, okay, we're going to give that to you. So you're stepping out of your comfort zone and you're just doing what you want to do anyways without letting these triggers stop you. How do we bring in this energy? Uh, so we can bring in the energy in different ways. Um, if we start a new job, we can, we're starting a new vibration, right? So then we start vibrating to the past vibration rate in a past life. So if we had a job in a past life that was really bad for us and we're doing almost the same type of job, then we're going, we can activate those blocks and restrictions surrounding that job because now you're vibrating at the same emotions you were then. Um, talk a little bit about aura healing. Aura healing. Uh, so when I do aura healing, I have the client lay down in a nice sound state and I just, I feel where their auras is. Now that I work with it more, I can see the auras and I can see where the holes are. And again, I just set the intention. I have healing energy flowing through me and out my hands. You never want to give your own energy to people. 
you just say, I set the intention, healing energy is going to flow through me, out my hands, and I am going to heal this hole in this aura. And then you just wait until you feel it fill up. You mentioned holes, so I would imagine that there's aura leaks. Yes, aura leaks. Aura holes, aura leaks. There could be cuts in it. There could be tears in it. There could be knives through your aura. There's many, many different things that can happen to your energetic body and to your aura. So every session I do with clients, it's always different depending on how they feel. Sometimes they have so many huge holes in their auras because they don't believe in themselves. They're so hard on themselves. They're making negative choices against who they are. Well, then you're going to cause holes in your auras and then your energy is going to leak. You're going to be tired all the time. You're going to be lethargic. Maybe you're angry all the time because you don't have your energy. It's leaking, literally leaking out of you. Um, I mean, we just talked earlier about attaching souls. What do we do about that? Attaching souls happens when pretty much we give up our free will to some people. So in a past life, maybe your mother was an abusive mother. She can actually attach to you and come forward in this lifetime and they can run specific programs within you. Your mother was angry at you because she didn't want you to leave home. So she wanted you to feel guilty for leaving home. So while she's attached to you, she's going to keep feeding you guilty, -ish, right. guilty energy. So how do we manifest? When you're manifesting something and we're doing a manifest session, what does this manifest energy bring to you? If you want to manifest money, what does that energy of money mean to you? Does it mean happiness? If it means happiness, then you need to go out and do more things that bring you happiness. Mm. You need to step out of that comfort zone and say, you know what? I'm going to go on a bike ride because that brings me happiness. That can actually bring you money. If you set the intention, money means happiness to me. I'm going to go do things that make me happy. It's going to keep balancing back to you. Manifesting really is about setting the intentions and knowing how you manifest. So choosing negative karmic uh, scenarios, like maybe perhaps being incarnated into an abusive family. So it depends on what you did in your past life. So if you were in a family that was abusive and you didn't resolve those issues, you're going to be reincarnated into the same situation so that you can resolve it. Until you resolve it, you're going to keep going through the same things over and over and over again. I had a client that in a past life, they owned a factory and they missed a step and somebody died in that factory. Now they neglected to tell their wife in this lifetime and they felt really bad about it. This lifetime, they were actually born into a family that neglected them because the subconscious was holding on to the fact that they felt bad about being uncomfortable. So you're going to reincarnate into a family based on that vibration rate of how your soul is when you reincarnate. I mean, this is pretty obvious. We should be really careful about our thoughts. Absolutely. Thoughts can actually be really scary. <laughs> I'm going to throw an example here about my thoughts. So I started working with intentions a lot more. I was setting all these intentions. Cause the more you set intentions, the faster the universe is going to give you what you want. I was driving with my son one day and I'm looking, I'm like, I really want a new vehicle. Before I even said that I hit a deer and I got a new vehicle. My son said, mom, watch what you think and watch you what you wish for, because your thoughts are always going to manifest. Now, the more you give your thoughts, control, the more faster it's going to happen. So if you focus on, I want to move to Costa Rica and you know, and you keep focusing on that, focusing on that, focusing on that. And you make these actions while you're thinking about it, you're going to create it faster than if you don't think about it. Your thoughts create your entire reality. Go to the grocery store. I only see happy people. You're going to see happy people. I go to the grocery store. I'm going to see angry people. I'm going to see angry people. It's like you're driving. Well, Hey, there's a yellow car. Now you're thinking yellow car. It's going to be everywhere. You're going to notice yellow cars everywhere. Do you feel lost or overwhelmed with your emotions after a tragic life event? Are you struggling with an adversity that just doesn't seem to be getting better with traditional therapy? Hello, I'm Julie Dillon McMahon. I'm a certified Reiki master and divine guide. I'm available for one-on-one -on -one sessions where I assist you in dropping into the divine portal where we restore harmony and balance back into your life. You can book these sessions at lifetoafterlife.com.
Now, instead of relying on pharmaceuticals to fix emotional discord, many now more than ever before are clearing past trauma and seeing emotional and physical healings. I've also seen for many for it to become life-changing once they release this reoccurring dense energy. Can you explain to me what clearing past trauma is all about? Well, I guess in a snapshot, whenever we experience an overwhelming, disturbing life situation, if we can't process it, if it's not a um, situation where we can think about it and understand it later and get over it quickly, mm -hmm. and it stays with us, that's trauma. So it invokes negative thoughts about ourselves, self-beliefs, and a lot of negative energy comes with our own negative thoughts. So it creates this perpetual cycle of negativity that we begin to attract negative things into our life without realizing it subconsciously. For instance, a thought like, I'm not good enough, right. I'm a bad person, that comes from trauma, it's not true, but subconsciously we feel it and vibrate it from that moment of impact. Say we were hit as a child and get the message that we're not good, we're bad people. Mm -hmm. And so that I'm not good energy vibrates and grows. Trauma doesn't go away with time. It grows over time. It gets bigger and grows. bigger. Kind of like a mushroom effect and starts attracting. Because we have new experiences to add to the stress ball. That's right. Okay. Kind of subconsciously and invisibly, this energy of negativity, of not good energy, is attracting other not good energy for future events. For future events. Okay. And if we don't learn from it and clear it, it keeps happening like a broken record over and over again. And if we see a repetitious pattern in our life of negative events happening, um, it's good to look to the root of where it began. So let's just say someone is having, they were abused or something like that, and then they get into a relationship that's abusive. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? It's common, yes. So we kind of project this out because this energy is being put out to create next year or the future right. and then we get away from that person and then we find ourselves without clearing it in the same scenario again right. so we're trying to different situation but the same pattern so we're trying to stop this right. stop the cycle. cycle from happening over and over why would anyone come to you to want to clear up all this it's kind of a rhetorical question right. but why would people come to you for to clear up this well, usually a crisis happens to get most people to come to therapy but a wise person who's just having disturbances that keep repeating over and over may get an insight that they need to look at where it's coming from. So it's really important, not only for ourself, to clear it out of ourself and change the thought from, of course I'm a good person, yeah. of course I deserve good things. And when we elevate ourself that way, we're elevating our energy, our spirit, our vibration is rising, and we start attracting people of the same caliber, see people of the same resonance, because like attracts like. We think we may be doing it for ourselves, but we are each other. We're helping each other. We're putting a, a loving vibration into the world, which is needed so much right now, that every person who clears their trauma is helping to clear the world of patterns also. So this is really important. It's very important. So why do you think that this particular time, we're in 2021, why is it so crucial that we all do this, this type of inner work, this clearing up old traumas and karmic cobwebs, if you want right. to call it something like that? Well, it's important all the time. You know, it's important in every age, yeah. but particularly, it's a great question because at this particular age and time, the population is exploding and growing. The more people on the planet, the more disturbances on the planet, the more polarity and fighting between people, that's growing. So you can imagine if 7 billion people are thinking negative thoughts and upset and um, inside. Yeah. The separation, the loneliness, the, the anger, the division, the judgments. Right. It's all really up and close, right. up and center. So we've got so much negativity around, it's hard to decipher what's reality and what's not reality. And so it's, it's, everyone is implored to go inside and look at themselves and clear themselves and come from a loving vibration. And every single person that comes from a loving vibration 
is amplifying the love in the world. Yeah. So it all, only takes a committed handful group of people to change the world. Margaret Mead said that. To change the, the vibration. The vibration, yeah. Which elevates us. Right. All. Right. Kind of all boats rise with each wave, just, just mm. that wave. Yeah. What does that mean, stopping that cycle? Well, a thought, a memory has a thought and a feeling. There's energy to a memory. If you close your eyes and think of any particular memory in your life, there'll be pleasant memories that'll bring a good feeling, and there'll be disturbing memories that bring a negative feeling. So it includes the thought, like, I'm not good, uh, but the feeling is what resonates. That propels the energy yes. that creates, manifests right. the future events to... And that energy usually has an image, whether it's a memory or just the energy itself. Mm. So it's good to be able to connect with the vision and the, the memory of what's, what's wrong and what happened that's negative, mm -hmm. and then you're able to go into it and clear it with different methods. I mean, it, it takes a therapeutic approach. I mean, some people like... Um, Reiki masters can balance the energy, and people can work on energy in all different forms. Um, in psychotherapy, there's techniques that actually target the brain and the nervous system, where that energy gets stuck in the body. And it can get stuck in any of the energy centers, including the chakras, the meridians, and the vessels. And this can manifest into a disease or an it, ailment. W in time, without checking it and without transforming it and releasing it, it can turn into an impact to the body. Sure, it can cause dis-ease. What disease is, is not being at ease, not being at peace. So it's really important that even if we're not happy or with situations in life, we need to stay peaceful and centered so we can handle what's coming at us. I remember you mentioned uh, Balance is, is uh, important with uh, all this. Can you elaborate on balance? Well, it's to keep all of our energy moving in a positive direction. See, we have billions of cells in our body. Mm -hmm. They're all moving. And they're all moving clockwise in a clockwise positive direction. And that makes us feel good. Mm -hmm. When there's a trauma or an impact or a negative event, it gets stuck. It can stop. So it gets out of balance. And gets out of balance. Okay. And can actually reverse and go backwards, which is the worst. Ooh. So when we're in a reverse state, um, we're going into a negative and negative and more negative because we're just going, think of it counterclockwise, into the past, into negativity. So it's not just grounding. Right. It's more than that. It's much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, grounding and staying balanced and centered is something we can do for ourselves every moment. And it's important to, sure. to practice that for ourselves. Trauma, you need a little intervention. You usually need a little help. And it's usually... Dig in and yeah. pick it out. or And it's good. I mean, I've been a trauma specialist helping people heal from post-traumatic stress disorder and traumas for over 30 years. And I experienced a trauma myself three years ago, and I wasn't able to get myself out of it. And I considered myself help. a specialist. I needed help. And it was an awesome um, understanding and experience to... Um, it was an aha moment that you really do need to go to someone else. And I did. I went to another trauma specialist to help me because it was too close. It was too personal. And I was too judgmental of myself and uh, uh, hypervigilant about the work I was doing on myself. I wasn't able to do it. So it's good to go to someone who knows what they're doing, is an objective observer, an honest person who has skills that can help you release the trauma. Now, some people like to say that these... Uh these past uh, traumas have a karmic. What do you feel about karma? Well, karma means action. It's a Sanskrit, it comes from the Sanskrit in, in, in the East, and it means karma means action. So everyone has actions. So if you think about trauma as an action happened, it caused a, a thought, a negative thought, and a negative feeling, negativity itself is going to pull us, as I said, it's going to create situations that come to us because of the subconscious negativity. So once we bring it to the light, once we heal the trauma, okay. Okay. the action stops. So if we were to say you're clearing karmic residue or energy, you're kind of clearing up those negative actions. Right, we can do it right now, right here, right now. Right. We don't have to worry about how many past lives we might have had or are we gonna experience something from, 
No. Once you become enlightened, it's over. You know? Yeah. It's, a, it's done. I had asked Jesus for guidance about the subject of anger. He explained it to me that there are four reactions that can come about when someone becomes angry with another person. Number four was, did you react physically and punch this person? Number three, did you engage in toxic language? Number two, did you evoke a dense emotion with yourself? And number one, did you have a toxic thought towards this person? He then went on to teach about the power of our thoughts and emotions manifesting into our future reality. So you and I talked about the power of thought coupled with an emotion creating that, that action. Can you talk about the power of thought coupled with a strong emotion? The emotion is the charge, it's the electrical charge of your state of being. So when you have a thought and it's emotionally charged, it's going to bring that forward. Always be in charge of the thoughts you have. You know, choose the thoughts that you have. Have them line up with your frequency of emotion. And from that, you will, you'll have a well-balanced state of being, which I think everyone's trying to achieve in the current state of the world. So let's just say it's a husband and wife, and they, they realize the power of thoughts coupled with the emotions. And they really want to start to change their thoughts. And they really want to have better control on their emotions. Just think how powerful that is, if a power couple could do that with each other. And that's the beauty of harmony. Harmony is resonating with another human being, especially if it's coupled in a loving state like a husband and wife. So from there, you, you can always resonate with them to say, is that really how you feel? Is that the thought that's in your highest good? And then that awareness that the person as your wife is bringing or your husband, you shift automatically in frequency with their with their awareness because you, sh you share that same loving space. Yeah, I know, like with myself, I'll have a thought or I'll say something and I'll go, this is just in habit mode. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm una unaware of it and I say it or I think it or I th you know, feel it. And that's because the brain has memorized patterns. So if we go on the scientific level, yeah. the brain and the synapsis, which is an electrical charge, is a memorized pattern, which is why they say if you always do something new, you're bringing newness back to your awareness in a constant state of being. It's like, go, take a different route to work. What that will do is open up your perception. You'll be able to perceive things from outside your habits. Okay, so let's say your client decides they want to have, they want to start a whole new life of creating loving emotions towards everybody. What's your advice? Like, how do you help them with this? So if they want to start creating loving emotions towards people is to be familiar with what a loving emotion feels like. Mm -hmm. So start seeing where you get that from others and then remember it. Mm -hmm. Once you start practicing and receiving it, then you can actually start to be it and do it towards others. You know, monks actually spend time in contemplation on such things like kindness they sit with the energy of kindness and just feel it, resonate with it in order to become it. Can you shed some light on this idea of a destructive emotion or a destructive thought? You know, like creating havoc for yourself or something. There are such a range of emotions that we can embody. That's the gift we have as this human life. Some of the emotions are of lower frequency vibration. And when a human being is in that state of a lower frequency vibration that wants to, that's destructive to themselves or to others, or they're just not sure, as soon as you are aware yeah. and you feel into it and you allow it and you're tender with it, you can then just release it and you can also shift it. The importance is the power 
to shift the frequency, that you, you harness that power, you have that ability, even if it's for a moment. If it doesn't happen with just bringing your awareness to it, then change your experience. Actually physically get up, go outside, go out into the sunshine, even for a moment. Sit in nature, and yeah. nature will actually respond to you, even in that destructive state that you're in and cannot shift yourself at that moment. Nature will come, you'll, you'll see a bird, you'll see a random hummingbird. It, it, it's amazing what actually comes forth to assist. And it's not only nature, but that's why they say to have five really good, caring, loving, supporting people in your life. If you reach out to them, mm -hmm. what you will get is the benefit of their voice, which is a frequency, their love and support for you. And the minute that you receive that from them, your cells know to respond and harmonize with that which you cannot hold on your own. That is why we can support one another in the time of need. That's why we go to Reiki practitioners or other gurus that can help in the assistance of holding the frequency when you can't. And then when you're in that state of being and wholeness, you can then be that for others. Something that was really effective was just, I know you talked about nature and sun and all that, bird, hummingbird, but also breathing was something that you had mentioned. And I was like, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Mm. Just take it. Yeah. To just pause and breathe. That is the inspiration. That's the prana. It's the life force energy. Just by invoking that, mm -hmm. it will shift and change even the most destructive thoughts to just breathe, just in and out, long enough that your awareness is now on something other than the destructive thought. And it's really that simple. I think in the 3D realm, a lot of us were programmed to think it's difficult to think that it's very hard to achieve, but it's really just allowing the shift to happen. You know, there's still many that believe that there are positive and negative emotions. I think all emotions are part of the human experience. But these are an instant feedback of your state of being. They're there to allow you to see where your state of being currently is. So when you get that emotional awareness, then you can choose to elevate from there or to dive into why sadness is here. Allow sadness to be the teacher. You know, it's there, maybe you're experiencing a memory and maybe that memory is tied to deep love of a soul who you used to share time with embodied on earth. And if you go into sadness, it will lead you always to something meaningful. And so I personally, when I'm in the lower frequencies and I allow it to be there, mm -hmm. I always follow it to a place of it's tied to something in my heart. It's tied to something within me that I'm navigating. That's a feedback of where I'm at in my life currently. And then I just choose to engage in a direction that makes sense of it, that allows it. I don't cover it up, I don't run from it, but I just allow it to be there. And it won't stay there. Emotions are just a frequency biofeedback, like a picture, a snapshot of where you are currently. That's why emotions are ever changing. That's why it's best to be in the flow state to allow emotions to come and go and to be experienced. It's only when we take on an emotional state that it becomes more part of our character. Mm -hmm. We become words like depressed because we're emoting sadness in kind of a more frequent state of being. So I would think that having understanding what you're saying is that emotions like anger, loneliness, worrying, and you said sadness, 
can really serve as great teachers. They all are great teachers, just like bliss, happiness, yeah, joy, joy are also great teachers. Mm -hmm. The reason that we want a lot of people are trying to attain happiness is because it's an elevated emotion. It's a higher frequency state of being. It sounds to me like what you're saying is it's not really negative and positive. It's just a higher frequency. Because you just showed me the difference between sadness and joy. See, when you feel into the emotion and you allow the emotional to be an electrical charge mm -hmm. and you allow it to resonate in your being, yeah. and then you bring it to your thought, what's coming up with that emotion? Now you're coupling them into wholeness, basically. Yeah. There is no separation. I'm feeling this and I'm thinking this, but there is just one state of being and it's always giving us feedback to where we are in our life. Our situation, who's in our life, how we feel as we're walking through life, it's all in the present state of just where we are now. Then what exactly is an emotion then? An emotion is a chemical charge inside the body that's an instant biofeedback of your current state of being. And when we allow emotions to be just that, then we can always reorient our frequency and our being to the emotion that we want to embody. Wonderful. It's harnessing the power of choosing our frequency and holding it in that state. Yeah, one that better serves us. Yes. A while back, I wanted to do some inner work on myself because I had noticed that I seemed to have some reoccurring loops that kept playing over and over in my life. So I went deep into my childhood and found some buried trauma that occurred when I was a nine-year-old boy. It was like watching a movie where I was able to observe it objectively from my current adult perspective. Now once I rewatched this trauma, I was then able to sit with this boy and let him know that I was there for him and that I reassured him that everything will be fine moving forward. I was actually surprised at how easily he understood it, got it, and was able to move forward. Obviously that goes into cord cutting. Correct. And so that I knew that you had done that with me as well. Yes. You said sometimes you'd hear a snap. Yes. I'm like, wow. One time I had a hook. Yes. One of the cords. Yes. <laughs> what is a hook and a cord? Is that like really in there good? Just Yeah. So, you know, because, you know, we're so resilient as children. Mm -hmm. In my years of doing inner child work, right? Mm -hmm. A child is so resilient. Even if the child has succumbed to a form of mental, emotional, spiritual abuse, the child will still be loyal to actually the abuser. Mm. So this allows for a clearing. It's not just a lover, husband, wife, mother, brother, sister. It's in all our relations. We really want to look at, particularly here in the center of the gut, which is the solar plexus, or in the Sanskrit language, we call it the Manipura. And the Manipura is the firehouse. <laughs> and that firehouse is all our relations. And so when we're having this interaction, there's like this energetic thing, like even you and I right now, we're facing each other. These tentacles of, I wanna have a relationship, I just wanna have a connection. You know, a form of soul connection, intimacy. So it's very important, and this is true. I teach my seven-year-old grandson, Patrick, if I said to him, Patrick, clear your energy field. He'll stand, he'll look at me, he'll spread his legs and go, like this, Nana? It's like, yes. Why not? Why are we not talking to the children about this medicine? We will, we will. Yes, we are. And you're telling us right now. That's it. And when you live in the tribes, among the tribes, which I'm so humbled to have traveled around the world with various tribes and cultures, it's, it's like brushing your teeth. It's second nature. So the cord cutting is very important in all our relations, in all our interactions, and not just with people. 
and systems, structures, and paradigms, things that are charged with energy. On a daily basis, there's a basic, simple process where you just take that right hand and sweep it and cut it. Take a sea salt bath and remedy it. You know, light a candle, look at the flame, and transmute what feels heavy. You know, we don't have to hike a big, long mountain and uh, have this whole, you know, month-long process. It's too, we got things to do. It's, you know, we, we can keep our system pure. Which comes into something that else that, that you brought to my attention was, uh, what did you say, you called it uh, spiritual hygiene. Spiritual hygiene, yes, yeah, thank you so much. On a daily, that. weekly basis or something? Daily. 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 Spiritual right. hygiene. And again, simple, you know, in, in my corporate life, I had this acronym. It's called SMART. Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timely. Well, it applies in all aspects of our life. If it's not SMART, action-oriented, we're not going to do it. Life is moving too fast. There's too much social media, everything penetrating. Mm -hmm. So you have to have it where it's quick. Get in, get out. Clear, you know, clear ourselves. Um, sea salt baths is good. Lighting a little sage and incense goes a long way in our and environment. Sweeps. Yes, and, and grounding and grounding techniques. Sit on the earth. Let your feet be barefoot. This has scientifically been proven, right? To walk on the ocean, to walk in the soil, to walk in the grass, and also to know your seven chakra systems. You know, because you can move, these are energy systems. You can move through and up those systems. And what I call, as a tantrika, a yogini, is the sublimation factor. Because these chakras down here are gross, chaotic, and messy. And that messiness, when we're having interactions with system structures and paradigms, people, personality, I mean, it's a, lo it's a lot. So you can do simple, basic processes in your chakra systems through meditation, through yoga, where you sublimate the crude oil of those chakra, one, two, three step is what I call it, and you sublimate and bring them up. You bring that fire that's gross, chaotic, and messy to your ajna chakra. That's the third eye, and the third eye is like an arrow. It's very accurate. It's wide angle perception. And you can expand your intuitive download feeds and knowledge from taking this gross, chaotic, messy fire and refining it and sublimating it and feeling the love, the expression, which really we all want in the world, which is love and service. That's why we're here. I've got some exciting news. For those of you that have been watching this and all the other Life to After Life series, we'll now have a place to go where endless topics on spirituality will be made available. We will be uploading lectures that will give you the know-hows and the tools to make your ascension easy. Now the knowledge that I've gained through the making of the Life to After Life series combined with the divine downloads that I receive will be broken down into lecture courses. You will be able to have that life that you've been longing for. So go to lifetoafterlifeacademy.com and see what we have in store for you. So we talked, we talked a little bit about dysfunctional uh, loyalties. What about uh, contracts and mm. stuff like that? Beautiful, yeah. And you start to see how everything ties in, right? Mm -hmm. It all just, you know, and if we don't have the checkpoints, okay, clean this up, okay, let's refine this, okay, let's sublimate this, let's do the, you know, hygiene, then we get backed up, bogged down. We're carrying 30 trash bags of our ancestral karma to ancestors we never even met. It's like, it's crazy, you know? So it's like, when we look at that... I love you, but you gotta go. <laughs> yeah, you gotta go. I mean, you gotta go. And we actually do a better service in that way. So tell me that question again. So we were talking about, uh, just it's just a prompt, contracts, dis uh, dysfunctional contract. loyalties yes, and stuff you. like that. Yeah, Yeah. so the contract work is really important. And I love to do the contract work with couples. 
Ah. And sometimes in occupations. Oh, so tell me about couples. Yeah. How does this work? Yeah, so when you do the contract work with, with couples, say, for example, I have two right now, two married couples I'm doing contract work, right? Okay. So they were married 15 years ago. Okay, they knew each other five years prior to that. So when you get into this unconscious, because most are unconscious of the contract that they just consummated in their relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is we're now in, you know, the time frame we're in, evolution moves, but you're still dragging the old contract. And I do feel, believe, that this is a big root of why our divorces, I think, last I checked, 67%. It's crazy. Yeah, especially now. Yeah. So, you know, and if things are moving fast the way they're moving, people aren't even, they're not even grounded to do their purification work, to do their hygiene work, to do their loyalty in the ancestral realm. They're not conscious of the elements that are surrounding them. Then we just keep packing that backpack full, full, and we're carrying that loyalty that contract in that relationship from 15 years ago. Listen, we all have phones, right? Most people, we have a computer. Don't we get a prompt every once in a while? Update your software. Why aren't we updating the software in our contracts, in our relationships, to the here and now? Beautiful. That's it. And if you have a partner that's willing to do it, it's beautiful. I mean, for me, I have them walk on fire. You know, we break arrows, we bend rebar. You know, it's a little radical, but hey, you know. It works. It works. So tell me about this uh, now or on this relationship thing, this miracle grow oh, mantra yes. that you're telling me. Yeah, so I have this expression that's relationships are like miracle grow on your character defects. So let me say it again. Relationships are like miracle grow on your character defects. That's not just an expression. What, what we can say to that is if we say to our egoic mind and our psyche, hey, here's a memo. Relationships are like miracle grow on our character defects. Get with the program. Then what can happen is when we're getting irritated with our partner, our lover, our spouse, whatever, because they've left the cap of the toothpaste off, we can just go, ah, this is my expanding Consciousness, I got a little miracle grow on my character defects. So feel the irritation in that and do your purification work. Because it has nothing to do with the caps not on the toothpaste. It has to do with something inside of me yes. that needs to come up and out. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Binding agreements. We mm. talked about that too. Mm -hmm. So can you shed some light on too? Yeah, so you know, they're conscious and they're unconscious. And it, it ties into the contract, it ties into the loyalties. You can have binding agreements with the dead and you can have binding agreements with the living. Mm. And sometimes we step in, I have a, 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 an expression that I frame and talk in my own mental psyche that I'm going from here to the grocery store. But from here to the grocery store, eh, there's probably about 15 energetic landmines. And what that means for me is, I think I'm going to the grocery store, but before I get to that place, there's gonna be several fields of energies, currents of energy that are gonna shift me. Be ready, be rooted, be solid, be grounded, and be clear. So in this, it's like, okay, these loyalties, these contracts, these binding relationships, consciously and unconsciously, it's a way to really, what I feel we really need to do is sit with ourselves, Sit with that gross, chaotic, messy fire and really give yourself the place, the grace to go in and explore. What is my neediness? What is my unsoothing uh, yearning what's that inner child plural s children because they're running amok inside there what is that child looking for needing mm -hmm. and then you go into saying to your partner 
my husband, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my boss, my best friend. You're not my parent to the inner child within me. I'm that person that's going to nourish this. You know, like your beautiful expression that you uh, had going on there with the nine-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Because it's like right there you captured from that wound to that graceful man of medicine. Mm -hmm. You know? So beautiful. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing is a psychotherapy in which the person being treated is being asked to recall past trauma while the therapist uses bilateral stimulation such as a side-to-side -side hand movement. Now the EMDR community believes that they invented this in the 1980s. However, hypnotists have been doing bilateral movements for over a hundred years with the use of a simple pocket watch. Now here the hypnotist relaxes the client and simulates REM sleep processing, which is what we do every night when we retire for the evening. The hypnotist then makes a suggestion and addressing the client's trauma and achieves great results. So let's say I'm a new client and you're going to do an assessment on me. What would you uh, first do with a, doing an assessment on me first time? You know, every therapist should take a good history. Yeah, just so ask questions. Ask questions. Get a feel for what's going so on. So instead of sitting for a year talking about your life, <laughs> I give you a multimodal life history questionnaire and you fill it out on your own time. It's very cathartic because it... It's, it's a body, mind, spirit exercise in that it has a whole realm of what's going to touch you emotionally and physically and of, of things that happen in your life. And I asked for the top 10 traumas of your life. And I asked for your ancestors, a little bit about your ancestors, where they came from. My job is to read that history and get a real sense of who you are, where you came from, what your traumas are, and know where we're going. So that's one part of the assessment. And I do two assessments. The second assessment is what I call a cognition assessment. And it's really a negative cognition assessment because there's a list of negative thoughts that, we, that come from trauma. Like I said, I'm not deserving, I'm not good enough, I'm a bad person, I shouldn't have done this, or anything that gets stuck that vibrates in a negative way. And the way I do it is take you into a relaxed state of mind where you're peaceful, and on what's called a Likert scale of disturbance, it's zero to 10. Zero is absolutely no disturbance. You're at peace, you're in heaven, you're just you know, sitting on the beach or wherever you are where mm -hmm. you're calm, no disturbance. 10 is the worst you could possibly feel. A lot feel. of pain, a lot of... Extreme, it's the high end. You know? and some people come and say it's 100, you know, they're tens or thousand, and you get it because the life history is pretty, pretty, disturbing. I do the negative cognition assessment by having you relax, be at a zero, stay at a zero, and then I'll read to you one at a time each thought. That's a lie, but it's disturbing thought about yourself, a self-belief. When I read the thought and at a zero, you're thinking about it. If there's no disturbance from that thought, it's not there. So we're not going to go fishing for things we don't need to do. But when I read a thought, when you think about it, and you get a charge, your body gets a body sensation and a charge to it, you can even feel where it is. Some people feel it in their legs, their heart, their head. You know, you can identify it. I check it off. Is it a 1 to 10? You tell me what it is. I might note it's in the heart. And we go on through 40 or more thoughts like that. Gotcha. And a person who has every single thought a 10 I'll say that this may take a little while. Not going to be one or two sessions, you know. What person who just has one or two thoughts, and maybe one or two traumas, a big T trauma, just one single incident, big trauma, that can be cleared fairly fast. Usually, be one session, one or two sessions, it could be done. Wow! Right, with the techniques. So, along with EMDR, which is the bilateral brain stimulation that helps get you into the right hemisphere of the brain and the left hemisphere of the brain, because the right hemisphere is where the trauma is stored. When we have a trauma, 
our adrenals are flowing, our energy's going, and our adrenaline goes, we get this surge of energy, and it's like, <gasps> and there's no words, because with trauma, there's no words that can describe it. It's just all energy, all emotion. And then it shocks, I call it shock and lock. It, there's a shock and it locks into the nervous system. It's beyond the amygdala, which holds emotion and releases emotion in the center brain. There's an, the amygdala is, that's the part of the brain that does that for us. So it just stores it. And some people bury it, some people talk about it all the time, can't stop talking about it. Um, but there's, to become in the acute phase in 30 days, if you're going into PTSD or not, because in 30 days the brain can process the trauma. It takes a while to process it and bring the words. Oh, it was just a bad um, accident. Someone wasn't thinking, I'm okay, nobody died. You know, so you process it, you process that, and you start bringing down the shock into the frontal lobes of the brain, where it's going from left brain to right brain, the feeling to the okay. thoughts. And you integrate it, you digest it, and it's over. But after 30 days, if it's still there and you get symptoms of PTSD like flashbacks and you can't sleep and you're having anxiety and depression and recurring negative feelings. There's a whole range of symptoms that happen with PTSD. And if that's going on, go for help as soon as possible. Being aware of your emotions is the first step in gaining your control of your future and also not falling into the trap of giving your power away. Let's just say a spirit, you're aware of it, you're spiritually bypassing it with maybe an antidepressant or something of that nature instead of having that emotional awareness of what it is you're feeling. It basically numbs you. So now you no longer can have this emotional awareness from the antidepressant. They, there are medications out there that cover up the emotional state that someone feels trapped in. Mm -hmm. It's even in the street drugs. The young adults of the world are trying to get their hands on some of these in order to escape emotions. Right. But by bringing your awareness to the emotion, Allowing, yeah. allowing that emotion to be there. To work through Because it. those medications, once they wear off, everything that was experienced is still going to be there. And actually, it's going to come back stronger because you were in a numb state of not, not experiencing it. So it's just kind of being built up. Controlling thoughts maybe from friends and family that just, it seems like I hear that a lot, you know going on my friends my family all these controlling me thoughts you know what, what's your advice to them on that how to we, deal with them friends and family yeah we have people in our lives that like to share their opinion opinions and their beliefs karma and Dogmas, everything paradigm things that they're just uh generation 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 projecting onto us mm. some people feel and so just by recognizing that that is their karma, their life, their state of being, reorienting that you have the power to hold your frequency and yeah. not absorb their energy as yours, mm -hmm. not ab absorb their concern as your state of being now is to be concerned, but to come at a point of allowing them to be who they are, but not taking it on in yourself the things that they're experiencing. Right. And to do that is to just witness it. Witness and bring your awareness, that's not my state of being. We talked about a scenario with a friend or a family member trying to control. And not only did you, that's your opinion, I respect that, allow you to express it, but you actually showed me how you can shift their perspective and like, you're right. I didn't even think about that. You can. So remember, we're living in a universe that responds to us. So even a brother who's 
attacking you or saying things about you or giving you the concern about maybe you shouldn't be doing that in your life, he's telling his sister. You can stand in your truth and say, I'm choosing to do this because it benefits me. It is bringing me an experience that I'm choosing to be in. You know, it's bringing love into my life. It's bringing abundance. This feels right for me. Mm -hmm. So just by putting out with your words and speaking from your truth, mm -hmm. you're now permeating the perceived experience of the brother. And now he's going to be in that higher state of your truth and your awareness. You haven't succumbed down to his concern about your life or your choices, but you've actually spoken your truth held your truth, it's going to be harder for him to, so holding, her actions. So holding your place, mm -hmm. staying on path, staying on course, being true to yourself, being unaffected mm -hmm. by this. Because we know naturally the knee-jerk knee reaction would be, ah, I got to put up a defense and I got to put up a, you know, I have to have an explanation or I got to argue and fight. There is there is something with just being... Just being, holding your frequency and not engaging unless you choose to engage mm -hmm. and to hold your truth. It's really important right now to know what it is that you want and where your truths lie. If you know your truth, you can lead from your heart. And if you're leading from your heart, you can actually shift those around you when they come at you with concern, worry, disregard. Mm -hmm. Because it's easier for them to take on your security and your state of being mm -hmm. if you're not engaging back in the concern that they're trying to get you to take on. Probably takes them right off guard, too. They're like, oh, my gosh. You're, I'm not getting a rise out of you anymore. Because on a, on a level of all of us, we all want the same things. Security, belonging, the highest outcome. Everyone deep down is, is, is searching for that. So when you can hold that and another is in a lower frequency state like concern, worry, doubt, they're going to start to, at a core level, feel that trust that you embody. They're going to feel that security and that truth that you embody. And they're not going to be able to. It's, it's unwavering. It's going to allow them to feel that truth because truth is a frequency that is strong. You know, it's, it's a state that feels secure. The way our culture approach death is crumbling. More and more are beginning to understand that there is no death and that we continue on past the so-called death stage. He talked about a new way of looking at grief, this new grief paradigm that you're mentioning. Can you help me out with that one? Yeah, so I'll unpack a little bit I've been doing death and dying from the age of eight. My mother came from a very, very big family. A doula? Yes, so I'm considered a death doula. Okay. I was a grief counselor for 10 years. Okay, how do you know that? Yeah, so my mother comes from a very big uh, family, and I believe she came in this life with this gift, but she knew that she wanted to be of service to many of those siblings and relatives so in my family, we didn't send somebody off to a hospital or to a nursing home to die. Yeah. We brought them home to love them, to bathe them. I've been entrenched and saturated in ritual my whole life growing up in a village. And so those people came to our home to ultimately die, but they were sick, so we cared for them. Mm. And, and it didn't matter if we had to go to work or school or whatever. You just stopped and attended to the need of your loved one. Oh. And then it's like the universe knew that. 
It's like God knew that and just allowed for us to be taken care of. And so that's a little bit of the unpacking of what I've grown up with. And then I was a grief counselor for 10 years for residential people living and dying with AIDS, right? Mm -hmm. And then I meet, you know, the shaman that I was initiated as an elder in 2009, Maladoma. I met him before 2009, Somay. And the Dagara people of Burkina Faso, West Africa, they have what's called a radical grief ritual. And I led those grief rituals for years. I mean, with Priestess Path uh, Sisters, for women at a, at a gathering, I would lead those rituals for over 175 women that would just be sobbing, wailing on the earth in this radical grief ritual. And about 2013, my guide said, no more radical grief ritual. There's a new paradigm coming. Mm -hmm. And that new, so from 2013 to 16, I was basically downloaded with what the grief new paradigm, which I call as the trilogy is. And let me break it out to you real simple. So we have global grief, and don't we know it? We're feeling it in these times, right? Right. And then we have communal grief because we have binding loyalties in our community, our tribe, our village, and then we have personal grief. Mm -hmm. When you take the global grief in the way that I teach this, right, and you remove that, through, and I'll uh, share, so I do this through a past life regression. Because globally, there's some kind of comic, you know, experience from a global, which we're all feeling right now, is like this global pause, this global comma, right? So you take the global, and you do a piece of work there. And then you take the communal grief, and you do a piece of work there, which usually is in a soul retrieval fashion. Okay. And then you go to the personal grief. In 2016, I led this uh, trilogy grief ritual, New Paradigm, with 40 people on our land in New Hampshire. And when I got to the personal grief, out of 40 people, and this is a true story, seven of them felt personal grief. 33 people had no personal grief because we removed the global, we removed the community, they had no personal grief. Uh, they were actually carrying through an unconscious energetic field of loyalty, global and communal grief, thinking it was their own personal grief, and it wasn't. This is the new paradigm to grieving. Maslow's hierarchy, can you tell me how that works? Maslow's hierarchy simply is this, and I actually have a philosophy. I take retreats prior to us traveling uh, you know, with the restrictions that we have right now. But I used to take retreats all around the world, India, Africa, wherever. In order for somebody to be able to show up to do their inner work, their purification, their revelation, their expansion to their gifts, to the world, they have to feel three things. Where am I sleeping? What am I eating? And how am I paying for it? And if you can have the people and you get that out of the way, and I do, before I lead anything, I deal with your lack of scarcity, financial abundance, where you're not feeling prosperous. We track that, we discover that, and we reset that. And even that is actually from an ancestral, binding, scarcity, impoverished minded concept. You know, so that's also threaded there. So we look at, where do I feel my lack? Because let me tell you, I've sat with people that have wealth, and they are more scarce and lack-minded than people that I've been in a village that have had nothing. And it is, it's a resonance, it's an energy, and it's a, you know, a mindset. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at that, it, it's, it's really a liberation, it's a freedom. It's, a, it's like take flight and to really uh, evolve yourself and move yourself. You know, you had mentioned to me about something that you wanted to do with me during this week of interviews, taking into consideration the line of work I'm in, mm -hmm. and what it was that you wanted to do to me. Because <laughs> I never know what you're going to do yes, to me. Yes, I know. And thank you so much for trusting. 
I always trust yeah. you. I just, you know, I just never know what you're going to pull out of my Right. <laughs> yeah, so what I was saying is because, you know, you have such a global mission, mm-hmm. right? And not to say that you don't have a communal because you do or a personal because you, you have that mm-hmm. threefold development, right? Mm-hmm. And so when I was doing the work with you, uh, we've done a couple, you know, sessions and stuff mm-hmm. and doing my check-in through, and, and not just what I think I intuit, then qualifying that through a divining process. And what the divining process does is it takes me and my ego thoughts, minds out of the mix mm-hmm. and I confirm it. So it's a way to check me. And when I did, it was like, okay, for Craig and the work that he's doing, it's really important for him to have his spiritual hygiene protocol okay. and program. And part of that is to, what, what can I say? It's a Peruvian. I could do an African, Peruvian, Guatemalan. We could do several different protocols. I'm sure because, you know, you're my brother from another mother, you'll have many of them experience. <laughs> but this one was particularly a sweep and uh, with an egg. And that is to... Uh, raw, cre- raw egg, right? A raw egg, uncooked. Okay. And, you know, you, you sweep like uh, the four sides to a person. And then actually I can read the egg. And I was taught this from Peruvian twin charm and grandmothers. So we do the sweep and you break the egg open. And then I read it. Put it in a bowl or something? Yeah, you put it in a clear glass cup. Ah, okay. Yep. And I've done this to my grandson, mm-hmm. to my family, to my tribe, because again, Is that people, what we're going to do? Yeah, we're going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, every time you bring an egg into the situation, I'm like, oh, I'm getting the egg again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's one style. You know, because the other thing, too, in many cultures, inside the egg mm-hmm. is actually the life of the village. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so when I went through elder initiation for two weeks, that's what, that's what we learned. We learned about... The egg is the life of the village. I could probably give like a 10-hour course just on that anatomy of inside an egg. Yeah, I've seen a lot of pictures in your house of eggs. Yeah, and students just come from all over. Oh, yes, I was guided to give you an egg water fountain. I was guided to give you an egg, uh, you know, lamp. <laughs> I know, I saw the yeah. lamp. My, my elder staff actually holds a golden egg from Africa on the staff. It's Beautiful. Like, yeah, Mel Domi's like, yeah, you're just the egg lady. <laughs> so, you know. Which makes sense. You made yeah, me an omelet yeah, this yeah. morning. <laughs> yes, I made you a great omelet, right? <laughs> yeah, so the last thing I want to say about that is also because when we do the work and we know that, you know, the Sufis say, right? Where there's light, there's dark. Hmm. As above, as below. Hmm. As within, as without. So, as a light being, bringing the light to the world, there's landmines, there's roadblocks. So that's all it is, like, get, get in a little protection on you so that you can keep on keeping on. We've talked about our mindset during healing, and then there are times to keep things to ourselves. So you and I talked about, let's say a person has an ailment, a serious ailment, perhaps maybe a cancer or something like that, and the power of not really sharing it with others, maybe friends, family, coworkers, but being silent with your ailment. When you have an ailment or something that feels eminent like cancer, and you hold space without having to go out and seek validation from other people, It allows your cells and inside to have stillness. And it's in that stillness that the body can find its alignment. And it's in the alignment of the cells that you can bring about healing and pause. When we engage in others in our story, it's really easy for them to add the fear factor. They just jump to conclusions of the outcome. When we hear the words like cancer, or we hear the words um, like a diagnosis, there's already realities out there that have grave outcomes attached to them. So that is already put into the thought. When we're back to that thought and emotions create our reality. So by holding our story within ourselves, it just gives us space 
to create the outcome that we truly want. Even in the situation like an ailment such as cancer. And I think you had told me a story about someone that you know, and she had a little protocol. If you're going to see my son in the hospital, is, is that, was that something? That's correct. Her son had a brain injury, and she created a space within the hospital room that nobody was allowed to come in there that spoke of his brain as far as what the doctors were saying the current state was. So she prepped everyone to hold the energy that his brain was healing. Nice. And that created a space inside his room that was nothing but that outcome, that thought. And so she was harnessing, um, remember how we were talking about the resonance with each other, when they're coming at you with the fear-based reality or the concerns, you're actually creating the environment to align with the outcome that you want, which is always the highest, best possibility. And you do it every thought, every time. And you just keep doing that until it becomes a habit. Like we were talking earlier about how the brain creates these habits. You actually harness the power to create the positive ha habits, the positive outcomes. So what came of the sun? He was completely 100% back to his pre-accident state. That's true love. It is. What she did for her son. She did. And actually... She did it harnessing the power that we all have. Every single one of us has that ability to align with outcomes that we choose. Do you currently have an ailment or condition that is disrupting your wellness? Have you been seeking traditional medical therapy for years without much improvement and it's just not working? I'm here to tell you that you have the power within you to heal yourself. I'm Julie Dillon McMahon. I'm a Reiki master and divine guide that can assist you in harnessing the power to heal yourself and bring back that balance. Go to lifetoafterlife.com to book a session with me. So let's just say a spouse has an abusive relationship and they try to put out good thoughts and emotions does that mean that that perhaps narcissistic other spouse is going to automatically change and fall into place? We are only capable of changing ourselves, But when we harness the power from within and we start to align with the highest good for ourselves, even in a trying situation such as that, the environment around us will change. You know, one of the outcomes could be that that person decides that they need to change their living situation or they need to, they will, it will provoke a new experience for them when they start aligning with what they need. And that is how it's the perceived change in the spouse. But the spouse is part of the environment. It's things that we attract to us and repel from us. So by always holding the highest good for ourselves and for those in our life, then we actually create a field for alignment, whether things come towards us or fall away from us. People are experiencing an accelerated faster rate of things happening. How is that affecting their shift, their awakening, their ascension? The speed this, this is all happening for them. It's not taking as long to process. So when we see things shift so quickly, the awareness is right behind and we're just coming to it more like that. So the great thing is that we don't have to take the hard route anymore. We don't have to do it the hard way. And we we take, don't have to- We could take the fast track. We, ju we just need to hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> hang on. We just need to hang on. Um, we're living at a time that's not only accelerated, but, but almost, almost an elation comes with that because it's freeing. We're more free to have these life experiences one after the next. Living in the now moment, it just means that every experience folds onto the next and it, it creates the momentum to expand, really. It's all about expansion. It's not necessarily linear anymore, which is this, if I do this and then go to this, I will get to that. But if you're in it and you're aware of it and you just keep expanding, that's 5D. 
That's 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 one pointed omnipresence with with life and all its experiences. So you and I talked about some things that have been happening with yourself and me that um, our thoughts are manifesting things super fast. <laughs> like thought, it happens. You know, if I light this candle and I move it, it might just, yep, it spills because <laughs> it happens to be the thought is coupled with an emotion and memory and it spills even before you finish the thought. I know, you witnessed that. <laughs> <laughs> So with, a, with an example as, as the candle spilling, this can be applied to the careers, the relationships in our life, the I, I don't know if I'm at a job that's fulfilling. So lining up with the heart, what is it that I've always wanted to do? And thinking that like if, if there were no limitations, what would show up? Just by doing those two things, going to sleep and waking up the next day, being open to what the universe could provide, it would be, you would be, I mean, we're all seeing it. We're just amazed that opportunities come out of nowhere. But did they? Or did we, did we couple a thought with an emotion and we backed off a little bit, got out of the way, and then allowed it to just come towards us, mm -hmm. right? The universe is always coming towards us. It's responding to us. So if we keep reorienting our awareness to what we want, what we feel, what we plan to experience, then the possibilities come in. And now more than ever. Now more than ever because we're time and space don't dictate the outcomes. The outcomes are there. We just, we just need to align with it and trust it. You know, it really comes back to trust. Yeah, yeah. Trusting is the part that either keeps it at bay mm -hmm. or instantly brings it fast towards you. So, and, and people always ask me, well, how do you know what to trust? But trust comes from that inner knowing guidance. That's why we need to do the work. And that's why we need to drop within. Because if you go within and ask the question, there will always be an answer either given that, you, that you're aware of or a feeling that's a little bit more towards a pull that's how it is for me it's like it's a pull that this is going towards a higher outcome when you trust each of those inner knowings then you learn to trust the truth and then it's easier to make decisions Our family and friends may mean well, but they can put out negative thought forms in and around us. Don't judge them, but simply understand that this is their opinion and hold your truth strong. Stay on your path and not be wavered by these thoughts. Well, then what about preventative thinking? Preventative thinking, just be really mindful. Watch your thoughts and stop yourself if you have thought wait, is this thought positive? Is this thought negative? Do I actually want this thought to happen? Yeah. Or do I not want this thought to happen? And then stop yourself and retract and say, you know what? No, I refuse that thought and you can just push it away. There's another th trick that I teach my clients when you're working with thoughts is to be really mindful. And also if you find that your thoughts are getting intrusive, you can say, hey, ego, do you mind taking my thoughts and pushing those away so I don't have them? You're learning to train your ego. Ego is really important. You never want your ego to die because it's really part of you. Now we can train our egos to work with us. So you can ask your ego, hey, ego, can you remove this, the thoughts? I'm trying to meditate here. Can you remove these thoughts? Or I'm having a lot of negative thoughts today. You can set the intention that these negative thoughts are going to stop. You can ask your ego, can you remove your negative thoughts? So what are some independent negative thought forms? Independent negative thought forms are more of a collective consciousness of thoughts. So if you, if you know, your whole family thinks one thought of you, there's going to be more impact, more power in that thought. And then that thought is actually going to really manifest quicker. And it's going to be kind of almost an independent thought because there's so much power between thought. Tooth fairy is an independent thought. Everybody believes in the tooth fairy. So you have the collective consciousness putting into the fact of this tooth fairy. 
So it becomes an independent thought that is transferred to people to people. I mean, you mentioned something about being a silent healer when dealing with your own ailments. When you're working with your own ailments, say you go to the doctor and the doctor says you have this disease. Mm -hmm. You buy into that disease. You go around telling everybody, I have this disease. I have this disease. Well, guess what? Your body's going to be like, oh, we have this disease. Okay, let's make it worse. And let's make it worse and make it worse and make it worse. So now if you go and you find that you have this disease, you don't tell anybody about this disease. You keep telling yourself, I don't have this disease. You take the steps forward to cure this disease. I believe everything and anything with held within our body can be healed. And I have healed things in my body that should never have been healed, according to the doctors. You can heal it. So if you're trying to heal something, don't go talking about it saying that you have it because then you're just telling the universe that you have it. You're telling your body that you have it. So if you're dealing with something, it really is best to not speak about it, not talk about it, just heal it. It's only really to do with you, not really to do with anybody else, unless if you want pity from them. But why do we want pity from them? We want to heal ourselves. So the less we talk about it, the less we approach it and think about that we have it, the more we think, I don't have this. I'm healing my body. I'm going to do this and this and this, whatever I need to do to heal it. You're going to heal yourself. But if you keep going around, I have this, I have this, you're going to manifest it more. So being careful with the words we use with others, I would assume is real important. It is very important. Uh, if we put a negative intention onto somebody or a negative thought, this person is a bad person and they buy into it, of course, then you're going to make it worse for that person because then they're, now they're buying into it. I say, Craig, you're a bad person. You start believing it. And then other people tell you're a bad person. You're going to believe it more. You're going to believe it more. And oh, I'm a bad person. I'm a bad person. I do all this bad stuff. I might as well keep doing this bad stuff. You can really affect somebody. However, they have to want to believe in it. You can throw, people can throw negative tensions at me all the time about something. If I don't buy into it and I don't believe it, it's not going to affect me. Now, a lot of people are thinking, if I change my thoughts around a person, say a narcissistic boyfriend, if I change my thoughts around them, then they're going to change. Only if they want to change and only if they accept what you have to say at a soul level. Now, if they've already been told so many times that they're a bad person and you're trying to, I'm using my thoughts so I can change this person, it's not going to work. You can't change anybody by thoughts. You can't control anybody by thoughts unless if that soul wants it, unless that soul takes it on. So what about those that just are not doing their work? They just going to keep repeating the same patterns over and over and over and over. They may get it one day. I hope they get it one day. I mean, that's not really a good way to live by paying for the same things over and over and over again. But that's really up to them. We can't judge a soul on what they want to do. That's up to them and only them and what they want to do. You know, I think you mentioned, uh, to me that I, I had a negative spirit guide. Why would anyone want a negative spirit guide? So negative spirit guides, we've hired them when we're going through situations in life where we maybe need extra help. If we're being bullied in school and people are telling us that, you know, we're ugly, we're worthless and all this other stuff, we can actually hire a negative spirit guide to help us through the negative issues. Now, sometimes we'll hold on to those negative spirit guides past those issues. And these negative spirit guides can start playing self-doubt with when it comes to your self-esteem and your personal goals. And then forever, we're like, why do I have all this self-doubt? It's really because that spirit guide is playing that. So we always want to remove the negative spirit guides because we never want them. They just do more harm to us than the positive spirit guides. And it's like I said, we hire and fire spirit guides throughout our lifetime, depending on major life choices that we're going through to help us with certain things. What about the difference between holding and releasing? Holding, if you hold on to negativity, it can cause a lot of physical diseases. It can cause a lot of anger. It can cause emotional issues and it could leak onto other people that are around you. I mean, nobody really wants to be around a negative person. They're really not fun to be around. You're gonna hold on to stuff, then you be prepared 
for, you know, some people to not want to be a part of that life. And then the people that release it, you know, they're going to be able to do what they actually truly want because they're not limited by limiting beliefs that they're holding on to, limiting karma that they're holding on to. So it really depends on how the person wants to live their life. So what about outside negative thoughts? So outside negative thoughts can really impact us and impact how our lives are. So if we grow up in a family and they say, you're never going to amount to anything, you're never going to amount to anything, you're going to get a low paying job because you're not smart enough to go and do this. You're going to go through school. I'm not smart enough. Everybody told me I'm not smart enough. So you're really not going to try very hard. And you're going to end up with this low level job because you buy into this belief and these thoughts of other people and other people's thoughts can become your own thoughts. So it's really important to block out other people's thoughts on you. So you don't take them on as your own. In this time that we are in, we need to understand that all that is false, dense, and hidden must rise to the surface in order to be seen and recognized. Not to some, this may feel like we're regressing, but that is not true. So yes, many are feeling disconcerted, but all is as it should be. The approach is to stand back and objectively observe and understand that you no longer align with these beliefs that were formed by the world's laws, societal rules, and traditions. I don't know about you, but I think that many are experiencing major shifts and feeling confused. I mean, I'm hearing it all over the place. <laughs> are you hearing this? They, they are confused because they're starting to be aware of their family members. They're starting to be aware of their relationships. They're aware that the institutions that they once followed or trusted are not either there or they're crumbling or they're different. So that, that's a state of confusion, um, which is why it's important. And I remind people, you go back to that drawing board. You go back to the inner knowing of what it is that you believe and start from there. Start from there. And that point of confusion can be at least not as intense when you just reorient to where you are now with anything and anything that that seems confusing just start with how you feel about it and then if you can determine how you feel about it then you can then you can build a truth and it's from that truth that you can start to mitigate the confusion because each time you do that it builds more of a foundation within yourself which is the state that confusion cannot exist in. Things are surfacing in people's lives, now more than ever. Are you finding that? I think that this is the time of revelation being revealed. I think that the world is, is just coming back into alignment, and so things are surfacing in order for them to be regenerated. So what is surfacing in their lives? The current state of their being. That's the state of consciousness now. We're all starting to wake up to, do these relationships serve me? Does this job fulfill me? So everything that's being surfaced is actually under the um, light of awareness. It's literally the, the, the feedback of where my life is and how yeah. do I feel about it? The feedback of where my life is. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing more and more that people are saying, you know, Craig, the things that used to work are just not working anymore. You hear that? And that's because complacency is being kind of shook up. We're not meant to be complacent. With the realignment of the earth back into its perfect alignment, we as beings part of this existence are also realigning. The things that aren't working anymore are the blessing to come back to that heart. I think all of us are unplugged enough that we are branching away, breaking free, and following our heart. And it's leading people to 5D relationships and to doing what they always wanted to do. People Being are starting to remember what they played when they were four or five years old and starting to rekindle 
the original passion of what we signed up in this pre-birth plan. So part of the breaking free allows them to be more autonomous and independent as a sovereign being. And what greater thing but to bring your passion and the desires of your heart forward by doing your own yoga class online. We have so many platforms where we can just get on and share our authentic self with the world and get direct feedback in kind of a harmonious, like-minded community base. You know, we talked about the realization of harnessing that power within. You know, we have this power within that we have forgotten. And it's from that point of authentic power from within that we can dictate a beautiful life experience here. And by each of us doing that individually, that's how we call the new earth forward. That's how we experience the new earth that's already here, is by authentically always walking in our light and our higher self and trusting that we're worthy and that we're accepted and that we can interact with the environment and the universe and that we're not victims to any of this, but we are actively participating with an intelligent universe that gives us back the same frequency that we give it. I know you touched on this before and I'd like to bring it up again, which is you mentioned the string of experiences. So living in the now moment is a string of experiences because life is an experience after another, after another. So by always reorienting in this non-time-space reality that we're living in mm -hmm. and always reorienting to the now moment, you can just harness the power of choosing each experience as, as you have it. You're an active participant with kind of controlling more of your reality by having an experience. And if, and if you tune in and it's something that isn't resonating with you, that's kind of heavy, that's pulling you down, then you choose then within that moment to have a different experience, whether it's an emotion or an actual, like an event or going somewhere, but you just activate that power to choose a new experience when the one that you're in isn't resonating. Thank <laughs> you.